Hello, I'm Graham Buchan. First thing I'd like to do is to thank Patrick and Peter for keeping Dodo going through these various lockdowns. Dodo is an event I've gone to on and off for a good many years. And I'd like to thank Patrick for inviting me to make this contribution. First poem I'm going to read comes from my fourth book, which is called Burglar at the Zoo. It's a sunny day at the zoo for elephant, bear and kangaroo. Penguins splash and macaws squawk. Parrots and hyenas talk. The lion dreams about a feast of jackal and of wildebeest. A line of school kids, single file, or should we say a crocodile. Spot the leopard, glimpse the goose, southern snakes and northern moose. And as the sun sets ever red, the animals prepare for bed. They close their eyes, begin to snore, thinking, who could ever ask for more? We are well housed, we have our meals and entertainment from the seals. But they dream, occasionally, of what it's like to be free. That's not a very typical poem for me, because I hardly ever use rhyme. Uh, and obviously it's a bit silly, uh, but to write a rhyming silly poem is quite good sometimes. Uh, the next one isn't all that typical either because it's a love poem. This comes from my second book, My Gaudi House. Gaudi will build me a house with melting balconies and scattered glistening tiles and walls glazed mother of pearl. And in my Gaudi house, Van Gogh will paint me a room with solid, simple furniture, a bed and chair squashed and foreshortened, and the stars outside dripping like lanterns. And in the Van Gogh room of my Gaudi house will lie you, a Rubens nude. You're slim, I know, I know, you're slim, but you will lie voluptuous, content, smiling and serene and no cellulite. And I will love you, my Rubens nude. And as we love, our love will be recorded by D. H. Lawrence. He will chronicle our climax and pontificate on the meaning of men and women. And as we slide down the other side of love, I will take you, my Rubens nude, and Van Gogh, and Gaudi, and Lawrence, out into the hot vibrating night under the dripping stars, and we will go drinking and dancing, and that includes you, D.H. Lawrence. You're going to dance. Also in this book, there's a sort of nature, or maybe anti-nature poem. The truth is I'm not very fond of nature. I think of nature as being vicious and nasty, viruses, volcanoes, earthquakes. Who's in charge here? Are you looking at me? Are you looking at me? I am the sea which spits out the land. I cut a swathe. I snap trains and buses. I trade babies for fish. I fuck your mobiles and internet. Are you looking at me? I'm in charge here. I am the sea which spits out the land. I am the fire in the belly of the earth. I cut a swathe. You worried about good and bad? About charity and torture? I trample your computers and put bodies into wells. I trade babies for fish. I am the fire in the belly of the earth. And my gangsters are coming to get you. Turning now to my third book, which was called Lucky. It contains two quite short poems on the same page. Uh, they are not about my parents, but they are about two people who I was very close to. A mother. Life has to be ordinary. Life has to continue. 
I did not see my parents again. Neither did I see my aunts and uncles. I know they have been murdered. I have not been back to the house where I was born, nor the village, nor the city nearby. I do not know if the house where I was born is still standing. My family do not have a grave, not even a marker. Life has to be ordinary. I have a daughter. A father. The spikes on the wire are colder than cold. The gruel in the cup is thinner than thin. The trees that we chop are harder than hard. My skin aches. My bones are brittle. In me, a little boy, perishing. Later, I see so much killing. Death is a familiar. I find later my mother and father have been murdered. My brothers and sister have been murdered. The house and business are gone. Later, I find a woman and we marry. We have a daughter. Those poems might go a little way to explain why I have had a long-held hatred of both fascism and socialism. A few years ago, I was invited to an arts and poetry festival in Iraq. Two little poems about Iraq. Saddam. The hangman's rope doesn't stop at my neck. I feel its taut fibres through all of my limbs. I feel its tight coils knotted in my abdomen. I feel the weight of the twins suspended from each foot. The fourteen-year-olds who were arrested, tortured, burned and murdered. No need to cut me down. I drip semen, blood and shit. In Saddam's palace. The huge room on the fourth floor, airy, with an ornate circular ceiling, and the side of windows lording it over the Euphrates. Dirty now, dusty, and graffitied. The terror, the cancer, the psychopath's moustache. These are some somewhat more recent poems. Music I did not dwell in the dungeons of the mad, nor taste the sharps of the warlike and angry. My river fanned out from tumult, a rich glow of nutrition, rice and barley, a mud too soft for cathedrals. The cellist faces the sea, her hair sways with her bow. The universe mimes indifference to our fates. I see horses float in the air above the busy prisons of language. I did not dwell in the dungeons of the mad. Death is hidden in clocks, clocks like sleep contained the idea of death. Music is held in the watery air. Music alights on the skin. Pints When men fall silent with the weight of their lives and women continue to chatter like guns, a welcome tiredness settles on the beer. Grease-stained newspaper blows down the street, and the young remain hooked in a here and trivial. They are men wedded to life by sin, war, and adventure. They sit in quiet corners. Earlier, they might have called to the barmaid, Nurse! 
when the man next to you explodes, the warm wetness of his blood painting your face. You don't go weeping to wife or psychiatrist. You trace out the rings stained into the table and remember orange coconuts gathered high under whispering fronds like so many testicles and the silly tattoo on his arm and the pleasure you felt in firing back. Memories of an Optimist He chanced on a tea dance outside the gates of heaven, or was it the gates of hell, the old and decrepit, looking old and decrepit? He remembered fondly how trees like to hold hands under the soil before a chorus of curious insects, and how the leaves turned to the sun. The last of the rapists was expected to kill the girl. He remembered the Christmas tree which grew its own tinsel and the light in the children's eyes. The head man, very old, thin, brown wizened skin, yammered incessantly, incoherently, his hands in an attitude of prayer. The sergeant was becoming impatient. He remembered Mary who kissed him in the cupboard. It was warm and damp. When they entered the village, all the houses were already alight. He remembered the waves washing the sand. I read that poem at a particular event, and I did notice a look of what you could call horror or shock on a couple of faces when I read the line about the last of the rapists was expected to kill the girl. But as it happened, some months later, I was reading Max Hastings' extremely good book about the Vietnam War. And there's a passage in that book which reads almost exactly like the poem. So I don't offer any apology for that. Uh, I'm about to wind up, so thank you very much for listening this far. Uh, a tiny plug. I have a YouTube channel, and on that there are clips of me reading both my poetry and poems by other writers who I admire. I'm going to finish with a couple of somewhat lighter poems, both concerning sexual intercourse. Woof. You said you liked it doggy fashion, but were surprised when I went woof, woof, and annoyed when I ran naked into the garden, condom dangling, and fetched a stick back in my teeth. Please throw my stick. Won't you throw my stick? Go on, throw my stick. Noise. Give me a quiet wooden cabin on a quiet creaking ship. Give me quiet light, quiet books, quiet fellow passengers, a quiet crew, and quiet border guards. Let my quiet ship ply a quiet river with quiet fish in quiet mysterious depths. Let quiet Multiply on quiet. Take me, quiet ship, towards a quiet woman with a quiet smile, quiet hands, and a really noisy orgasm. <laughs>